We would like to welcome everyone to a lecture by Bailey and Bailey. In their studio, they believe that good design is born out of refinement. The material palette of their project consists of robust natural and renewable materials, and their buildings embrace the concepts of use and time. Sustainability in building design is also one of the key features of their projects, as they advocate for less is better and design for longe longevity, durability, and efficiency. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if, uh, can everyone see my screen first of all? Yeah, we can see that. Yes. yes. Um, Got, you've seen Bailey Bailey PDF there. But yeah, so first of all, just let's say thank you for um, inviting me to speak to you. Um, I've, given, I've given a couple of lectures previously to this at Schools of Architecture in Scotland, so which I'm kind of quite, quite familiar with, so it's, it's nice to be able to um, all be over Zoom to you guys um, from a distance. So um, I'm going to talk about several of our recent projects this afternoon, uh, including this one, Kitdara Farmhouse, which we completed just last year in August 2021. But I'm also going to um, talk a little bit about, about our, our, our studio and put a little bit of context around, um, around us and where we are as a studio and, and the work that we're doing. Which is something that I always found kind of quite interesting and quite useful when I when I was a student myself. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're quite a young office. I I think like like quite like quite a lot of young studios. Um, the process for us for for sort of setting up the business has been has been a has, a, has been a, a sort of gradual and kind of evolving process. So I, I've been practicing. As Bailey Bailey for um, around three years, but but the prior to that, prior to officiating the business, I started working with my brother Martin Bailey, which is where the name Bailey Bailey Architects um, originates from. And we started working on sort of competition competition proposals, um, evenings and weekends around around our work and in practice, and then sort of gradually that became. Um, became a, a, a studio and for around three years we've been working on um, working on commissions and, um, and and working towards building building our projects as I say it's been a very much a kind of evolving collaboration and um, the studio is, is now a partnership with my wife uh, Megan Bailey and also our part two um, Tom Stark and together we're all we're all involved in sort of everything effectively that comes that comes through the studio um so i just wanted to i just wanted to sort of go back to those some of those early early projects and, and show a selection of the uh, the competition proposals or, or sort of early commissions that we worked on which are all projects that didn't progress into opportunities to build i think there are eight projects um up here one's a duplicate um we we did around just maybe ten or eleven competition proposals over over a few years, um, and we're lucky enough to have some some projects shortlisted, um, and commendations, and so on. But, but fundamentally, lots and lots of kind of lots of lots of work that went into those early early days as a studio, without getting that opportunity opportunity to build. Um, and I think there's there's sort of um, pros and pros and cons to that. It's it's very much an opportunity to to build your portfolio, and also to kind of prepare for that first opportunity to build, pre prepare your process and your um, your sort of way of approaching approaching pro projects. But architecture, I think, is a is a very slow a, a very slow endeavor, um, and can take a very long time to. To work towards that sort of opportunity to um, to be commissioned to to make it work, but through persistence, we were able to to build our first project, which was a small pavilion 
which we won through as one of those international competitions. And we're able to build a small shelter for cyclists on the banks of the River Loire in France. And around the same time, through collaboration with a former tutor of mine, Charles Rattery, we were able to build this um, reworking of a, a Victorian semi-detached property in, in Yieldside, which was an excellent early opportunity to, to start to kind of learn the process of, of detailing and fundamentally of constructing architecture, which is which is something I'll kind of talk a little bit about through through um, one of our more recent built projects. And I think that's um, particularly for a, a young practice, the process of, of building is something that you can't really you can't really learn. Uh, you can't learn it in an academic context. You can't really learn it without doing it. Um, so without kind of you know many years in 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 practice, um, it can be something that you really have to 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 kind of in, endeavor to 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 learn. And I'm talking about really trying to build kind of ambitious ambitious architecture. Um, how to work through some of those sort of those those details and how to um, realize your ideas. I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the interests and preoccupations that we have as a, as a studio that, that inform our work. Um, I've always been interested in the city, in streets, squares, courtyards, lanes, the, the spaces between buildings effectively. Um, this was a drawing that, that I made for my thesis project when I was, when I was in fifth year. Um, and kind of speaks about an, an interest in building as um, kind of inverted object so rather than building as a as, as, as a form or as, a, as an object in space the the idea of that architecture can be about a structure of spaces um, in this case the Hotel de Sully in, in Paris which is this kind of intriguing matrix of formal courtyards and, and gardens with, with little connections through between um, internal and external space is a very kind of rich um, sort of textured building. And that's an interest that I've explored through, through, through several years of teaching practice, um, both at Dundee School of Architecture and at, at Strathclyde. These images are from a project that, that the unit did in Vicenza in Italy, where the students engage with a very, um, with a site within a very dense urban block, kind of Forcing that, um, forcing that way of thinking about about embedding embedding a building within its context, um, and thinking about how the the building expresses itself to the to the negative spaces as sort of um, containers um, of, of social interactions and and um, an idea about sort of positively charged urban space, um, and these sort of types of spaces, spaces contained by buildings um, can also be a quality evident in, in kind of particular rural scenarios where much of our work is, is now focused from kind of informal groupings of, of farm buildings, yards, um, as well as um, typologies like coach houses, the image on the left, and also more formal cloisters, monastic buildings, like the example on the right, which is Iona, Iona Abbey. So this slide shows six plans um, for houses that we've worked on or are working on in the studio recently, which kind of speak to this idea about making, um, making the footprint, the arrangement of the building, Sort of articulate an idea about about the spaces between, as well as the as well, as opposed to building as object. Um, and while these sort of vary in their in their in their scale, um, some of the larger houses, for example, kind of the the rural domestic program lends itself particularly well to this to this idea of. Um, a series of structures, including things like spaces for work, increasingly outbuildings, and um, spaces for extended family, degrees of separation between parts parts of a dwelling, 
but also in, in a couple of the smaller, um, the two smaller house plans here. Kind of even at that at that um, fairly small scale, trying to think about the spaces that the arrangement of the of the building form creates. So in the bottom left, for example, that just slight pulling apart of a longhouse typology to create a sheltered space and um, taking advantage of the view to, to the east and, a, and a, a, an arrival space to the west. So trying to really make the footprint of the building work hard to, to sort of shelter and contain contain areas of space. Um, and I'll come back to talk about a couple of those projects in, in a bit more detail. But to say a little bit more about where we are where we are currently as a studio. Um, we are in both Glasgow and the working both Glasgow and, and the Scottish Highlands. And as I mentioned, much of our work is now um, focused on rural domestic projects, and this is something which we're, we're very much enjoying. So we, we have a studio in Glasgow in a very urban feeling space um, in the salt market, which is which is where we started. We started the practice in Glasgow, but um, over the course of the last um, couple of years, largely partly to do with the tra trajectory of our, our work and also um, the kind of trajectory of, of our kind of lifestyle and way of working. Um, and also, the, I guess, the ability to, to work slightly more remotely that we're, that we're kind of experiencing at the moment. Uh, Megan and I now work from this building, um, which is actually the coach house courtyard building that I showed in, in one, of the, um, one of the earlier slides. And that's this kind of this sort of move from urban to rural is, is something which um, is per perhaps a little bit of a theme in our work. Some of the kind of early interests that we had of our practice as a practice are kind of sort of explored, reinterpreted, translated into, into some of our into kind of rural way of thinking, rural sensibility. And I, I'm always interested in, in kind of um, using our projects to, to test ideas um, and then developing a framework of critical thinking around what we're doing, what we're doing in the studio. And we've we worked on several self-generated research projects that kind of allow us to that have allowed us to, to to think about um to think in a kind of deeper way about about how we interpret some of our our, our project briefs and, and, and ways of working. So um these are two exhibitions that we put on for, for a couple of projects I'm about to about to talk about um where we and, and, and what, in the first case, on the left hand side, working with a, a small group of other young architects to, to explore, kind of explore a research theme. And um, the image on the right, we were working with just a research project where we were, we were working with um, an organisation called Community Land Scotland, thinking about some ideas for rural housing and kind of giving that, a, giving that a platform through, through um, working with this organisation, Rural Land Scotland. Um, community Land Scotland to promote kind of um, and advise communities looking to um, manage their own land, buy their own land and provide housing um, in, in rural areas. So sort of academic projects in a way that, that have a sort of um, practical grounding and potentially sort of um, also motivated around, around ways to generate generate work for this for the studio. So the first of these projects was once again urban in nature and explored the idea of a contemporary interpretation of the archetypical um, Glasgow tenement building, which you see photographed here and on the, the drawing on the right hand side is a is a plan of the of the facade through the bay, the, the bay window, which is kind of ubiquitous in Glasgow and forms these kind of deeply modelled street facades that have this kind of um, sort of uniformity but also a variety in the way in the way that the, the bay windows fall within each of the each of the um, consecutive units and our project was very much about exploring the idea of a contemporary interpretation of the tenement a sort of model um, urban type for the contemporary city our proposal interrogated the bay window and the idea of the deep facade 
uh, as a way to sort of contain a space within the within the elevation. Uh, and in our proposal, that becomes a, a winter garden or a, a terrace balcony in, in south facing sides of the street, which becomes an immunity for upper floor living in the city, but also reflects this sort of this deep modelled quality that is um, very much a, a kind of common element in, in Glasgow, uh, Glasgow's urban architecture. Um, also exploring this through 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 model making, kind of subtly subtly interpreting interpreting the idea of this kind of tri tripartite facade, which in the Glasgow tenement, um, in sort of nineteenth century Glasgow tenement, very, is very much derived from um, our, the architecture of the Italian Renaissance. So a, a, a base, a plinth, a middle, and a slightly differentiated. Um, Upper story, and then sort of starting to think, um, engage with the idea of um, of the, the rural realm. Our, our work started started to take us towards. We started to to look at this idea of, of landscape and settlement, a project called Landscape and Settlement, which we undertook with Community Land Scotland. Um, applying a similar sort of observational approach where we're looking at an existing typology and thinking about how we might learn from that. Um, the Highlands of Scotland, this drawing shows a, um, obviously shows a topographical plan of a, of a strath or a glen in the Highlands, in this case, Strath Rora, and each of the, each of the, the black circles that you see um, indicates a settlement, a historic settlement, none of which are, are Currently inhabited, so these settlements were all cleared um, of their inhabitants around the eighteenth and early nineteenth centuries. Um, and the Highlands of Scotland in general were once vastly more populous than they than they are today, as this as this drawing indicates. And the inhabitants occupied innumerable small townships, following morphologically very distinct cluster patterns or groupings, which were scattered throughout throughout the glen, um, very much like a sort of a wider dispersed or archipelago community within the landscape. Um, and we were interested in there was a discussion around the time where we started this project. There was a there was a sort of conversation going on which came out of the planning bill, which, which was going through the Scottish Parliament at the time. And it was about wild land, um, which is a kind of quite a, you know, quite a central topic, and uh, particularly in the Highlands of Scotland at the moment, where kind of quite large swathes of, of the Highlands are, are being recorded and mapped as, as uninhabited wild areas, which are um, becoming enshrined in planning policy a little bit like um, a little bit like a, a green belt designation where if you're building in wild land it's there's a there's a designation in that area and there's a presumption against uh, presumption against development so but there are a lot of communities remaining in these areas and there's a very rich and very long history of of inhabitation that goes along with these places as well so so Community Land Scotland, as an organisation, were interested in, in sort of um, not not countering the wildland um, discussion, but just adding to that discussion that there that, that there is a this very rich history of of inhabitation in these in these areas, and also interested in kind of mapping some of these and um, having a discussion around around sort of both both and wilderness and and human occupation both of which have, have, have a kind of valid valid place so we became interested in this from from a kind of from an architectural perspective from an architect's perspective and we were interested when we started looking at the at these vernacular forms of, of settlement the houses are are typically called in scotland black houses um which are stone built kind of traditional Highland longhouses that are set low to the ground, typically with very, very deep stone and turf filled walls um, with thatched and turf roofs. And there's been quite a lot of study done 
um, about the, the kind of constructional nature of black houses themselves, but much less interest in the settlement patterns uh, around which these black houses are organized. So you can see from the drawing on, on the right that they appear to be rather irregular in, in nature uh, and they're often kind of dismissed or disparaged, dis disparaged on that basis. They don't have streets, they don't have, they don't have a kind of rational organizing principle. But when you start to look quite, quite closely at the settlement, you realize that there are a different set of organizing principles at, at work within them. So in this example, um, the settlement is organized on the hillside towards um, sloping down towards the river on a glen within a glen where the wind the wind sort of sweeps up um, roughly at the angle of the, the river that's shown here it's a there's a, a hillside sloping down and then slopes back up again towards the other the other side of the river and you find that these long houses are all orientated on on lee slopes or slightly sheltered slopes on the hillside and are all facing directly facing their, their narrow gables towards the prevailing wind and are sort of um, curved and chamfered slightly to, to buffet the worst of the, the, the of the wind's forces and impact and also that they use their secondary buildings smaller utilitarian structures like sheds and stores to kind of create additional areas of shelter which are nearly always positioned perpendicular to to the house itself to create areas of of shelter which are suitable for um, for growing crops and are further sheltered by by small walls and enclosures so there's this really kind of there's this really rich environmental response that that is the organizing principle so rather than a rational top-down um arranging of buildings this is about a sort of ground up um very much responding to the landscape itself and as such you get these quite intriguing um informal qualities where buildings are sort of hugging the ground and, and, and nestled very close to one another creating spaces between this is uh this is a drawing by, I forgot the name of the, the name of the artist, about, about connections between, about proximity and the, the kind of the interconnected nature of, of, of objects placing proximity to one another. Um, I'll, come back to the, I'll come back to the name when it springs into my mind. And then um, we kind of observed this quality in a range of different, um, a range of different settlements that we looked at across Strathbora, where each, when you look at the, the, the look at the wider site and the context for each, um, every single house is placed in a very precise, in a very precise way. But through a process which results in a, in a very kind of disordered, um, very random feeling way, so, so quite kind of contradictory to, to when, when you start to look slightly closer. And then kind of looking within those settlement types, we we sort of observe the the, the kind of the individual the individual dwelling which becomes formed out of usually out of several structures, a primary house, often often containing several spaces, including a space for, for animals, sometimes um, animals, grain stores, and so on are kept in separate, kept in separate structures. But the structures are often linked by enclosing walls. Again, creating kind of creating shelter and creating a space, defining a space within the landscape. Um, and sort of in, 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 in tandem with this survey project that we embarked on, we kind of started to look at 20th century uh, kind of prototypes that, that we sort of ob observed had a certain synergy with this idea about proximity and density. And um, also the idea of, of, of shared space and, and private space and closed gardens and, and maybe shared arrival courts and, and places that um, allow a certain kind of neighborliness between, between dwellings. So this example by Peter Aldington, turn the end is um, 
rather well well known example, which has some rather close um, similarities with the idea of, of of the kind of informal placing of of structures, and also the idea of the wall which wraps out from the building itself and, and, and claims little areas of of space for for private gardens. Um, we're also interested in the kind of vernacular palette of, of materials that's used in this project. So contemporary forms, contemporary language, but very much in a kind of low tech um, sort of rough, rustic rural palette of materials that reflects the, reflects the context of the village in uh, which it's situated in, in, um, in England. Uh, there's a couple of oops on your and its own references in, in this talk, which I which I kind of um, only quite became aware of the last the last time I gave this lecture. Um, this project is it's on fairly famous Kingo houses, um, which were just outside Copenhagen, I believe. Um, which again, kind of, we were interested in this as an interpretation of the of the idea of of. The cluster as a becoming a model, so a single type that can be sort of grouped together and form this little sort of village-like settlement that feels a little that sort of responds to topography and, and feels sort of in a way slightly organic in its um, in its arrangement, but is actually formed out of quite a rational and kind of well-ordered, repeatable repeatable type. So starting to think about how we could draw these things into into some of our projects. And then at the scale of the private, the private villa, thinking about the idea of house as settlement. So this project by Robin Walker, um, author Bowie in uh, West Park in South Ireland, sort of builds in an existing um, small cluster of, of existing forms, uh, adds, adds three new volumes, uh, very contemporary, in their expression and in their constructional qualities, joining them to this settlement in, in, in a way which is very strongly references the traditional um, cluster patterns that, that, that we had observed in Scotland and are also very prevalent in, in Ireland as well, uh, where, the, so where, the, where a single house effectively becomes like a little colony of structures. And another it's on project, Can Lee, which was developed um, Almost in a similar way, but, but incrementally around the around the, the original structure that it's on built as his own own house, and then sort of added added to um, added each volume in a in a sort of informal way, which which responds to views and, and the topography of the site, creating this sense of a, of a sort of a, a villa as a as a little settlement, almost as a little cluster of forms. So coming back to to kind of talk to, to talking about some of our projects and how those ideas of of kind of um, filtered filtered into the work that we're doing. Um, the first project that I'm going to talk about, house is we call house in the Woodland clearing, and was commissioned um, around the time that we started, or we were working on the on the landscaping settlement project observing these clusters within the, the Scottish rural landscape. And we were asked to look at this site, uh, which if you can see, I hope you can see my mouse, as uh, one of the, one of sort of four kind of planned cl clearances, um, clearings within this area of quite dense former commercial forest. So uh, this was, I think, originally a Christmas tree plantation that has become kind of wildly overgrown with um, kind of 20 meter plus high uh, large fir trees, uh, which creates a sort of, um, you know, the, the idea of building in a, in a clearing in the forest is a, is a sort of beautiful and kind of evocative uh, place to be able to situate a house. But in, in, in this case, it's actually it's quite a large clearing, it's around an acre. And the entire site is around four acres of, of this very dense, this dense forest. Uh, so in many ways, it's, it's quite kind of, it's quite featureless and, and also 
um, quite equivalent in each in each location. So you've got a point of arrival from east to sort of northeast to southwest, but otherwise this very consistent kind of perimeter, quite tall perimeter of of trees, which are all identical effectively. So it's a it's a site in the, in the round. There's no long vistas. Um, there's no kind of external organizing principle other than the, the point of arrival, as well as the path of the sun, which is also fairly restricted by the height of the trees. So we started thinking about a number of options initially. Um, I think the client had imagined building a sort of black timber longhouse when they when they first approached us to look at this project for them. They kind of brought a set of, brought a range of interests and, and, and preset images to us um, from which we were able to, to kind of start the conversation. So we started thinking there's 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 sort of um there's maybe three three ways to build on on this site we thought one is that you you kind of embrace the perimeter become become part of this consistent perimeter opening up and kind of looking back into the back into the clearings will become become part of the edge the other one another one is to, to place a sort of object in in the center of the space um something that works in the round and looks out in all, in all directions and another is to to sort of create a space create your own space and, and, and look inward as, as well as outward kind of create your own context in a way and uh, uh we sort of thought about this as is kind of an idea about circling the wagons. So if you're in um, a sort of open featureless desert, like the American West, for example, you know, you've got this quite quite nice idea about maybe lighting a fire in the center of a, you know, of, 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 a, of a totally open space and circling, encircling that with, with your temporary structures, the wagons and kind of gathering, gathering around that to make your own space in an otherwise kind of featureless and open, open plain. So there was, a, there was an idea about about using the, the brief, which was for a house as well as a, a workshop studio space, um, as a series of structures that would encircle a garden effectively. And we started to think about um, how we could organise that in the, in the centre of the site, create the courtyard, create this courtyard space as a as a point of arrival, um, and position a series of a series of kind of simple forms that look both out into a, a, a kind of planted um, planted garden, wild garden around the around the house, and then into a more kind of um, sort of formalized landscaped garden, which is contained by the house, almost like a the central room of the house in a way. Um, so I, I'm just, just what kind of while I'm talking through this project, I wanted to um, sorry explain a little bit, use this to explain a little bit about our process and how we how we like to work. So we like to try and work through through models as much as possible for every project. We will make a a one to two hundred site model as a starting point. We try to we we use the computer to develop our projects. We work in we work in SketchUp, of course. We work in and um, we, we work with CAD, but we also try to kind of not work entirely within the computer at the, at the early stages of the project. We'll try and draw um you know bounce ideas from our CAD drawings back onto back onto the face and paper and kind of really try and bring a, a, a process to bear on on how we how we develop the plans and not kind of commit that to 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 a, a 3D model too too early, so we we try to work with um, physical models that that we try and allow to to evolve through the process of of design. Um, so we started to with this project. We start we we started to work with with these one to two hundred um, quite small scale models that were quite quite loose and initially. An idea about this being a kind of consistent, interconnected, um, you know, sort of donut of space. We were looking at um, project in Glasgow by by OMA, 
Merton Pool House, which is the Maggie's, Maggie Centre at Garden Haval Hospital. She's got this beautiful, richly planted courtyard garden and an amazing kind of entirely glass perimeter around the building. I think we, I, we went to we went to visit this this building around the time that we started this project as well. And the building manager at the time let us know that he reckoned per square meter it was possibly the most expensive building in Scotland. Which when <laughs> when you're kind of interested in using this as a precedent and you're working with a domestic client uh, on a kind of limited budget is, is maybe something that, that is sets, sets alarm bells ringing. So one of the one of the early things that we were kind of conscious of in this project was was to use this I use this idea of a contained a contained courtyard, but but sort of express it and explore it and um, with an economy a certain economy of means. Um, and the way we did that was was try to try and think of this as much as possible as as kind of four eponymous structures that are individually quite simple um, pragmatic in their construction, but are just placed in sort of extremely close proximity to one another, minimizing the connections between them and the need for things like glass, the expression of glass links, things that we're not necessarily particularly interested in in any way. So we, we started to, to try and think of this as a little collection of simple forms um, and position a language of, of simply proportioned openings that, around that courtyard that, that, work, that, that work with interior spaces. We were interested in this idea of the kind of Japanese in Gawa, which is the, the covered space around um, traditional Japanese houses or Japanese temples around either around the outsides of a of a building or lining the lining a courtyard where the, the eaves extend out to, to cover a space and often the I think the Ngawa actually refers to the extended floor plate so a little sort of terrace timber terrace that runs around the building that allows you to, to sort of have this inside and outside uh, relationship between a covered space so I, we kind of thought this would be quite an attractive um, prospect in Scotland, a very kind of wet, wet climate. And this, you're in this sort of beautiful, um, beautiful garden. You're able to sit out on a, on a bench um, and then, you know, enjoy the qualities of the garden, but be sort of protected by and sheltered by the building, which is something that we've kind of continued to explore through a few of our recent projects um, using models to to continue to explore and develop that. We, we tried to, in this case, make a, make a model very early in the project, which sort of communicated something about the, the quality of the site rather than a kind of um, very architectural, very abstract um, kind of cardboard contour model. We wanted to make something with, with, a, with a feeling of landscape and, and, and kind of texture that allows us to as, as we are designing it, but also our also our, our client who we're kind of bringing along in the in the process with us a way of, of kind of really relating to the to what the idea of this little garden garden could be um, within this this context of of, of a very equivalent kind of uh, forest. Um, and in this particular project. We don't always we, we kind of struggle to get the opportunity to do this um, on, on every project because it, every project works at a kind of different a different pace depending on the, the client's priorities. I guess we're always trying to kind of make space in in uh, our process for um, for very kind of measured and careful careful development. Um, slow architecture, as I think Neil Maxwell. Um, obviously, wonderful architect practicing in Wales, rural office for architecture, uh, just you know describes their work as slow architecture, which is like something that we, um, you know, we're also very very conscious of, and something which is kind of often very hard to, um, shall we say, bring a, bring the, bring your client a, along with. So that, this project kind of, in particular, allowed us the opportunity to try and stay stay out of the computer altogether, and and rather than making 
um, 3D renders and working through working through SketchUp. We tried to we tried to to keep it in, in, in kind of physical form. Um, this is a one to fifty model of the of the full the complete scheme that we made that that really kind of was intended to bring you into that into that garden space um, and the, the qualities that that would that would have as a place to live um, and an organising principle for the house. We tried to work with the levels of the site. Um, there's this slight crossfall across the site to, to create kind of a sense of to work with it, to work constructionally with the levels of the site, but also to, to create a sense of um, variety and, and kind of journey through around the perimeter of the courtyard so that you, you arrive um, at the furthermost structure, which is a, a kind of public volume uh, to move around the courtyard. You move through this more private, private wing, which we, we wanted to kind of express as something slightly different so that you're drawn to the, the kind of the, both the, the, the very deep cutaway eaves of the of the kind of entrance space, but also the, the taller expression of the floor to ceiling heights. So we, we kept the eaves entirely consistent around, around the structure, but both internally and externally um, take several steps in the ground plane to express the, the volume, the more private volume as something kind of slightly different in character. Um, and then we, we've made this one to 15 model, which explores that, that taller public volume, um, which has is orientated north with its gables facing north and south, so that you have these um, large, the largest open, openings in the house facing east and west, one facing east into the courtyard, which takes in morning, morning light. Um, and then one opening to a kind of sunken terrace facing west that takes advantage of uh, afternoon and evening light as an outdoor um, cooking area and so on. And then the changing level to kind of make that demarcation of, of privacy as you move as you move into the bedroom wing. Uh, and this this was the plan. Um, the kind of final plan as it was submitted for planning approval. Um, so this idea of the circulation being organised around around the courtyard, around this garden, um, the east and west facing space that I just mentioned, circulating around to a kind of secondary snug living space and master accommodation, which is um, Sort of deliberately separated from from the from the primary bedroom wing, which is a small bedroom up in the attic as well, um, either for guest accommodation or for sort of um, parents to have a have a bit of um, separation from the family. And the fourth volume is a workshop um, for a furniture maker who's the who's the client for this project. The planning sections. So this was submitted for planning it in, in January 2020. Um, it was it granted planning, and unfortunately, our client uh, decided to sell the site. Um, so this is a project that we're, we're kind of very Bond of as a studio and, and allowed us to develop a lot of um, a lot of our thinking that has found its way into subsequent projects, but unfortunately, one is one that we won't that we won't build. So, moving on to talk about uh, Kipdar Farmhouse, um, which is a project that, that we have recently built. Much of the work that we did in this was. Kind of in um, in tandem with House in the Woodland Clearing, um, and there are similar a range of similarities and things that we're interested in in this project, but but also um, 
it's both at a slightly different scale and in, in quite a different context. So the the site for this project is in a very a very open agricultural setting, very flat for in a for a Scottish um, in a Scottish context, a very kind of flat, fertile agricultural area. Uh, and there is this kind of language of 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 little clusters of buildings kind of peppered throughout the landscape, but quite differently from, from the highland kind of vernacular clusters that we were, that, we, that I spoke about earlier. We're talking about, we're talking about um, larger farms here, kind of barns, um, agricultural buildings, stone farmhouses, uh, which kind of presents a, a certain scale. You can see that, you can see our house, which is actually quite a large, um, Quite a large house within this circle here, and you can see the kind of scale of the of the clusters and landscape here. Some, some really quite quite substantial buildings. So, um, yeah, so images of that of that context, quite quite spread out um, as well. So, so definitely a kind of different order of scale implied here. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start with the with the plan. And then kind of talk through a little bit about the development of that. So again, we're kind of looking at a series of volumes, um, which are organised in a in a much more kind of open um, and very loose way around a around a courtyard. But in this case, it's an arrival space. It's a kind of functional a functional space um, with a with a garage, which became a, a kind of a garage plant room gym um, as well as two so the house spread over two volumes one we'll see from the photographs is a, is a kind of a larger two-story form which borrows sort of proportions from from um from kind of traditional traditional barns um traditional buyers that lie around the kind of wider wider context and the the, the the organizational principle here was really about um, about firstly defining defining an arrival space in such an such an open site um, at the scale of the scale of the fields that you could you could kind of get an, an indication of from the context plan that I've just shown. Um, there's not much in close proximity to the building, so it's, it feels very open to to kind of stand in that space as we did when we, at, at the outset of the project. Um, so we wanted to kind of anchor the building around something. Um, but this, conversely to the House in a Wooden Clearing project, this site was much more about distant views. So you've got um, nothing much bit particularly close to the building, but in the distance you've got um, you've got hills, particularly the Gargunic Hills to the south, which the which the building looks straight out at to, to the south, um, as well as kind of longer vistas to to um, back to Stirling Castle, which is quite, which is maybe 10 miles away or so, but has a sort of very clear line of sight. Um, so the building was, was there's also this um, constraint on the site where you have to arrive from the from the south west. And the building very much wanted to look towards the hills to the south and also obviously benefit from the kind of direct sunlight to the south. So one of the first things that we decided that we would that we would utilize to organize the site was to was to basically bring cars in behind the building which kind of poses certain questions or issues about about the sequence of entry and um, which again was where the court with this idea of a kind of informal courtyard helped us because it gives you somewhere to arrive somewhere to arrive where you're not sort of driving past the building or driving behind the building to enter so allows us to control that and then this kind of slight chamfer um, this tilt and angle gives it gives the composition a kind of distinct tension but also sort of
but it um, very much evolved as as we moved through moved through the stages towards site. So this was a this was a project which. Um, sorry, I'm just going back to full screen. Which moved very fast towards site and um, really allowed us to think. Partly because of that, allowed us to think a lot more about construction and kind of focus on the details. So we we, we had this plan that was fixed at quite early, quite an early stage in the project um, in the project program, and then this kind of longer back end where we're working to, through technical design and, and then to, towards construction. We're able to just really work on that, refine that, and think very hard about how we we're going to make, how we're going to express the spaces and, and and keep the keep the idea sort of really clean, um, kind of um, robust, but um, quite minimal detailing. I think just to make it make make something quite sort of simple feel quite special. And we were able to build this project, um, which was an amazing opportunity for us. Um, quite early on, the client had brought the idea that they wanted to build a stone house, um, and we were open to open to that from the outset. But we wanted to express it as something that didn't feel like a traditional stone structure. So we, um, while it has traditional forms and has that kind of these quite simple and refined um, the simple language, uh, formal language, we wanted to use the detail to express it as something quite contemporary. So there's no expressed lintels, there's no um, coins, cornerstones. The, we, we worked quite hard to get things like glazing, meeting the meeting the kind of sculptural chimney without any without any return. Um, so all these things were, were were sort of detailed constructional challenges for us as a practice that we that we spent quite a lot of time kind of working through the house and the landscape. And I think the stone actually sits sits really comfortably within the within the landscape. It's quite sort of earthy. And the, the the house is red, often from quite from quite a long range because of this flatness of the area. Um, you can kind of see it across fields and it. Um, the, that this kind of scale of the stone operates quite well in distance. It has this variety of of kind of te like texture. I think something in a way flatter would would lose. And we used charred charred timber to line the courtyards. Again, thinking about detail, this this step. Um, I know I'm quite sure for time. I'm not going to say too much about too much more about this. Very much as I say, thinking about um, thinking about construction and um, and detailing. So back to this primary space, which we explored in one of the early kind of one for one for twenty models, um, with this datum set by the set by the windows. The kind of minimal um, internal elevation allows us to conceal technology, TV, and so on. It's all is all concealed behind these sliding. And sliding shutters and the hearth uh, fireplace feeling like part of the part of the kind of solidity of the floor. But two more projects to speak about. So I'm going to talk about these fairly, fairly quickly. Um, so this is a project that we've just started, um, which just started on site. The, the site for the for the project is was this um, concrete bungalow in a very in actually much poorer condition than it, than it looks like here? So the site, the project was to was to replace this house, but the house is on an amazing, amazing hillside overlooking uh, an expansive loch and distant views to the mountains in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, but I had this. I had this bungalow, which was kind of not really taking advantage of anything on, on the site of the kind of typical late 20th century, mid to late 20th century bungalow. Um, 
positioned quite close to the hillside, not using the roof to take in any, any light um, or any, a strange sort of kind of elevated platform access via you know, stairs and so on. So we wanted to, we wanted to, and also an object, it's very much a, an object which is just sort of dropped down on the site and um, doesn't have any variety around its edges, backs and sides and so on. So um, we wanted to, first of all, take, make much more of the views and we also wanted to make much more of the natural light on the site, which much of which comes from the south and west, which is the, the hillside, the hillside side of the house. So it's actually quite limited in terms of what you can get from, from the, the south and the west. Um, but the views are to the north and the east. So looking at looking out down the hill. So we wanted to make a, a, a monopit structure that kind of leans back into the hill and uses that tall um, rear elevation to just kind of scoop light down into the plan. And we also wanted to offset the volumes so that we could, um, this is one of the plans that I, that I showed on, the, uh, on an earlier slide, to, to create a sheltered space, again, with deep projecting eaves that, that um, kind of defines this area to, to enjoy the view but in a way that's not sort of completely open, open to the exposed hillside and the elements. And then also this kind of more utilitarian, utilitarian space at the back, kind of tight against the hillside, kind of carved out, um, that allows you to get a, a back door and a bit of a, a, a even more shelter. Again, working with models. And we're interested in exploring a kind of alternative material palette to this project. Um, borrowing very strongly from the Highland vernacular language of kind of whitewashed, whitewashed stone buildings, lime, um, natural lime wash traditionally. Um, and a lot of contemporary architecture in the Highlands makes reference to this with, with, with sort of very smooth contemporary renders, which often don't weather very well and also don't have the same sort of quality and um, pit textural surface as the, as, as the whitewashed stone buildings. So we're interested in this um, idea of, of a continuous sort of monolithic feeling surface, but one that has um, one that has a kind of underlying grain texture. Um, so we're borrowing from uh, Don Hans van der Laan, this kind of Belgian tradition of, of lime, of mortar washed, slurry washed brick. It's also used in this project by David Chipperfield um, and Pufa Gavin Gallery in Berlin. Borrowing forms from one of the other um, kind of persistent interests, Peter Aldington's turn end, and also from Arthur Bowie. So our, our project um, is kind of two similar, two equivalent volumes, uh, which are offset from one another, mono pitch roofs. And chimneys at the prominent corner. One chimney communicates with the internal space and the other communicates with the external terrace. Um, so they kind of look back at one another, creating this, this kind of outdoor living room, again, sheltered by these, which are extend what, about one and a half meters from the building. Large upper story windows on the hillside, the idea of bringing light in two orders of two orders of fenestration, these large openings, and also these kind of smaller punched openings where you need, you just need um, ventilation, access to um, a kind of selected view to the, the hillside garden. The elevation section, as I say, this project has now been, um, we've got planning permission, we're working through the technical design, and we're, we're looking forward to taking this on, on site later this year. We're making the structure of the house in cross laminated timber and with a glue lamb roof structure. Uh, so there's this idea about a very consistent timber interior, kind of monolithic timber interior and a monolithic masonry exterior. And the chimneys are the sort of bridge between the two, if you like.
And then the last project I'm going to talk about is one that we're sort of like anticipating a planning decision for any any day now one that we're also really excited about. So this is kind of strangely in a, another house in a woodland clearing. And it was kind of a an opportunity. In a way, it could have been an opportunity to, to revisit some of the ideas in the in the first project that I talked about. But at the same time, it was quite different. Kind of briefing, um, briefing constraints and a different character, a different character of site and a different um, actually a much more characterful sort of native woodland. Um, but some of the same, some of the same thinking. Kind of underpins the approach to the project, albeit that the that the form and organisation is is kind of quite divergent. Um, so, yeah, a sort of open native woodland. We looked at several sites to kind of nestle the house within within the trees, and um, some more one more open. Um, the site we ended up pursuing was was this one here, which is a kind of clearing. In the woods, which the, which we were kind of drawn to, and the client was drawn to, allowed us to to, to sort of um, sort of thread a, thra a track through the trees where you would kind of um, uncover this kind of surprising surprising structure within the woodland. Um, and again, with that, with the arrival. Um, being to the, to the southwest in this case, we wanted to kind of bring the separate vehicles from the from the sort of prominent views and the, 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 the kind of garden side of the house. But we also didn't want to, we didn't want anything, any sort of suburbanization of the site where you, you know, where you define a kind of garden area with a fence and um, a lawn. We wanted to kind of keep the integrity of the of the woodland so to have these quite hard edges to the house. Where you kind of don't touch anything, as I say, you thread this track through without without um, with removing as as few trees as possible. You leave the woodlands as an entirely kind of um, wild landscape, effectively, and then just allow the the house to define this very clear, contained space uh, facing southwest to maximize maximize sunlight, and, and use that to organize the garden and um, everything out with that. Is, is left um, kind of two, two points of reference. Another project I was on and um, sexy architects, this idea of, of a kind of masonry structure that almost feels like a sort of, you know, it's kind of ruin in a wild landscape in a way, and then with very natural planting. So the organization kind of is kind of coalesces around this idea of of two simple volumes which define define a space um, and the wall continuing out continuing from the building um, the gable of a mono pitch structure in this case to kind of wrap round and enclose enclose a space that belongs to the to the building and very clearly as I said demarcate the, the landscape around which you don't touch. Um, this project actually evolved, the, the brief for this evolved quite substantially through the design process, so from something quite kind of small, um, you know, just enough, just enough programme to make this courtyard idea work, it sort of grew through the process and we ended up working on a number of iterations that sort of retained the core idea, but it became something quite Quite different. We introduced this um, idea of a cloistered edge, again creating this um, sheltered space around the garden that acts as a, a sort of threshold interstitial space between between inside and outside. Um, in a more kind of in a more sort of formal way, in this case, um, we're very much drawing reference from from the from the monastic. Um, Kind of monastic structure in the landscape that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and it's oh, the, the building sits on a slight slope, so the courtyard is kind of embedded, embedded in the slope. So rather than 
the wall being built in a sort of flat plane, the wall is actually um, mostly a retaining wall. So the courtyard sort of sunk, something into the ground. The building feels like this. Again, I love like, this idea that it's a sort of, it's kind of ambiguous as to how old the structure is. It can be, you, we are often like imagine our buildings like, um, in the best case scenario, when you, when, you, when you design something well and you build it well, like it will last for, it'll last for a long time, hundreds of years potentially. Um, so whatever we, whatever we do now, we, you know, we see it as sort of contemporary and, and new, but it, as soon as you've built it in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, the building becomes old. And we kind of in, embrace that, that sort of everything is history in a way. Um, so we don't really get too hung up on on um, on newness, let's say. Our planning drawings. We're working in a woodland, obviously. So the context is quite um, the, the process for getting consents is, is is quite onerous. We had to, we had the surveying working up an agriculturalist surveying tag every tree in the vicinity. And um, we're we're making you know we're not taking trees. I think we're taking five trees down um, that are that are sort of um, have a are deemed to have a shorter lifespan. We're we're providing point um, nearly a quarter of an acre of compensatory planting because the whole area is considered woodland. So even though we're not removing trees, we're planting the equivalent area within this red line as um, as compensatory native woodland planting, which we're which we're very happy. Um, very happy to, to be doing and our, our client very happy to be working with, with a client who who kind of supports that philosophy. Again the sunken sunken courtyard and sheltered cloister. I'm just going to um, end with a couple of slides of a competition proposal that we've just that we've actually just finished. It, I think going to bring uh, bring together quite a few of the ideas that I've that I've covered in this in this talk um, from our sort of analysis and interest in in, in rural settlement types. This idea of proximity and density, the, the historic cluster typologies. Um, speak about, but also back to an idea about, about in a way, that come, an idea that comes from the city about the space between buildings being kind of condensers of social activity and, and, and community. So thinking about that idea in a, in a rural context, we've um, made a proposal for, for collective housing, uh, which very much kind of encapsulates some of the ideas, maybe going back to the the house in a woodland clearing about shared gardens, which become are about defined courtyard gardens, which in this case become shared spaces um, that foster kind of community and, and social interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, like, it's, it was really interesting to see how um, all your research about the clusters sort of feeds into uh, all of those projects. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'll start with a question, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, sure. And if anyone else have any question, has any questions, um, put them in the chat. Um, so this is a, a bit of a rewind back to the start, but um, I was wondering, um, when you were starting your practice, um, you said it required a lot of patience. Like, mm. over how many years was that? And like, was that um, a process starting in school or was it something that started after um, uni? And was it a bit of luck or was, yeah, what sort of yeah. factors influenced that a bit? Yeah, that's, that's, a, no, that's a good good question, something I... Um happy to talk more about actually um yeah so that that those competitions i mentioned we did more than 10 competitions um which is like hours and hours and hours of 
speculative work that was evenings and it's evenings and weekends um but that actually yeah started when we were at, at university um so i think i was in third year or something we 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 tried to do sort of you know we started by doing the very sort of open free to enter kind of ideas competitions that, that i think there's actually probably more of around around now than there was when, it, when i was studying really just to um you know just to just to kind of build our portfolio so without we weren't really entering projects that had a built a potential built output so those first those kind of first handful maybe those first few competitions were were done at uni but then we just basically continued that um continued that after uni and i think there was a point where um we sort of we set up a website we didn't really share it this was kind of before before instagram and stuff um we were so we were kind of moving towards thinking of it as a practice um but it wasn't yet so we were we were sort of you know calling it a design collaborative or something like that and we, we were sort of sharing our competition proposals on a website um but we weren't like looking for work sort of thing um i think at that point we we decided we were all throughout all of this while it was kind of portfolio building we were at the same time like i've always been sort of totally certain that i wanted to start a practice so it was you know i i was very clear that it was work it was work towards that but um maybe a, a year or two after graduation um we started to think about if we we're going to do competitions obviously your time becomes more your time becomes even more valued when you don't have the sort of uni, uni summers and stuff um to, to maybe get a bit of extra work in um we decided to work on projects that had a built outcome so that's where the the pavilion um in france came from we were we were kind of if we're going to choose to do something we're going to do something based on certain criteria kind of thing um, and we decided to enter that competition because it was set up to build it was set up to build the the i think two there was two two sites you could enter for either site and um then we had a bit of luck because we, we won that competition but i mean obviously we were kind of we put a lot of work into it and we were very happy with our with our proposal but at the same time winning any competition involves in, involves a fair measure of luck because i think in that case there was about 250 entrants um so you know you've got to be i think we had we had a kind of we had a good balance in that project with buildability which was a big factor for them because they knew they needed to build it for a budget so we kept it clean and simple but with a kind of strong idea so um yeah I've, every competition that i've ever entered that I, I i've never expected to win anything <laughs> i don't think you know you don't you don't do it for that reason but in that case we um very lucky to win it we built it but there was also some prize money for that project which we put kind of straight into a bank account um and you know i actually used that just to 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 start to start up the practice when i i started um i think in tandem with this we where we'd started to get a couple of um homers if you like kind of friends and family projects that we that we'd worked on um in our spare time and also just sort of um put that money in a business bank account sort of thing so when i started i really didn't have any work but i had enough to pay myself for the first few months sort of thing um so yeah i mean i guess to answer the question is there's a bit of luck probably you know like four or five years of, of kind of incremental building towards starting up um and then ultimately just like just going for it um and trying to make it work make it work you know and then so in the last three years we've went from we've gone from sort of very small scale very small scale projects kind of suburban remodels or extensions to um to working on projects that were like we're really sort of genuinely excited about and and um, and love working on in terms of the rural new build houses so yeah hope that answers the question yeah no that, that definitely answers it that was a, a really good answer thank you 
Um, we've got a couple more questions in the chat now. So I don't know whether people want to come on the mic and ask them or I can read them out. Um, the first one's from Elizabeth Hillier. Um, I, I've got them here if you want me to just... Yeah, I, I can read them out yeah. um, so people can hear what they are as well. Yeah, so sure. what's your favourite thing about working in rural spaces slash areas? Yeah, that, that that's interesting because I think when we first started, we were, I mentioned we were based in Glasgow, we, we didn't necessarily envisage ourselves being a rural practice, but partly that, that um, shift towards working on rural projects was actually a very conscious thing. Um, partly from our first year or two in practice, kind of figuring out what was out there in terms of, in terms of types of work um, and how engaging they were and you know, what we were going to get out of them. As, as architects who are you know very interested in you know mentioned our process and and working a certain type of project I guess that gives us scope to do that so that kind of some of those things led us towards working in rural projects what one because you know there's quite a good volume of rural projects in Scotland and um, in comparison to the opportunities there are for small new and small practices to work on to work on urban buildings because the clients are, tend to be commercial um, in Glasgow, particularly the sites are they're all quite quite big. So the first thing really is opportunity. You know, rural projects gave us the, this very direct way into working on um, sites where so much is possible um, in terms of bringing our kind of thinking and process process to bear um, but then I guess more and more through the that value of that opportunity we're able to really just kind of start enjoying the ability that you have working in rural sites to to kind of engage with the natural landscape and and engage with such I guess variety in the sites as well um, you know every we're working in such we're working in some amazing sites and each has just, I guess, within the, like maybe that's all we'll, we'll, we'll start to see a, a sort of maybe more repetition in the types of sites that we do once we've, once we've done 20 or 30 projects. But each of the houses that we've got have just a completely different context at the moment, um, which just allows us to, it doesn't feel repetitive. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a different solution for each, for each house, although we bring a lot of kind of um, consistent thinking to each the outcome is is going to be something different on every site so um yeah just it gives us that space really to to kind of um to sort of properly explore explore our ideas and i, and I think um all the houses that we're doing are all the projects that we're doing are, are houses at the moment um although we've got a couple of things in the pipeline that are that diverge from that you know houses give you Kind of variety of different space types. Um, you work with all the kind of raw ingredients of architecture, if you like. You know, you, you work with um, you work with natural light. You you work with materiality. You work with relationship to to surroundings. You work with kind of small scale spaces, larger open rooms. You, you've got that mix of of kind of everything that we do as architects, and I know a lot of practices or there maybe has been a historical bias against residential architecture um but certainly for us for, for me at the moment i i kind of feel that we've got we've got really quite a lot of sort of richness and flexibility to to to, to bring to bear in our projects within the kind of rural um residential market Yeah, that's a really interesting answer as well. I think where our theme this year is rural. So um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear about your research approaches to all of these projects and what you find interesting about that as well. Um, our next question is Valerie, uh, from Valerie, sorry. Um, and that's 
any advice on how to design civic slash public buildings in rural sites um, and how to integrate them into communities? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. Maybe one I'm not, not that well equipped to answer because um, we haven't had the opportunity to build any kind of civic or public buildings, although it would be, you know, something that would be, that would be extremely in, interested to do. So, um, yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think that's, I think that's a challenge. There, there are some, there are some good examples, um, good examples around. Um, I've not, I've been meaning to visit Carmody, um, Carmody Rourke's project in um, Lake Windermere, which is a sort of, um, I think has a kind of quite a strong synergy to some of the things with, that, that I've spoken about here. It's a collection of buildings um, at a larger scale that has a civic role and civic sort of um, civic scale, civic responsibility as a building, which I think is something that we'd be quite interested in, interested in exploring. Um, but yeah, I think there's probably quite seldom, seldomly opportunities um, to build civic and public buildings in rural sites. And I, I think um, probably, you know, scale and articulation is a, is a kind of interesting question. The, the rural landscape is predominantly associated with like domestic scale architecture. So how do you differentiate or how do you, or do you differentiate? I think is a sort of first question between Civic scale, as we would think about it in an urban environment, which has a which has a very which typically has a very kind of distinctly hierarchical relationship to the kind of ordinary buildings in the city. Um, you know, buildings, civic buildings, are larger scale buildings within the rural environment are often sort of stately homes or perhaps churches. Um, so there's for the types of kind of civic and uh, public buildings that we're that you're likely to be asked to design in the 21st century are probably quite unusual typologies historically you know there isn't necessarily a direct um a direct reference there which i think is which i think is quite an interesting prospect because what you know what are they like as i say are they, do, you, do you make a building which is like a like a settlement do you make a building that's like a barn you know what's that that's our way into projects often you know what's the reference what's the um what's the comparison or the analogy that we can kind of that we can try and understand learn from look at so i think that's probably where i would be looking to, to start that um process you know what what's its character what's its nature um and i think that's a very interesting question with civic um civic buildings in a rural environment so yeah, I, mean, I know that's not necessarily a sort of answer, but maybe it's a it's reposed as a question. I think that's still a really useful answer. Um, like, yeah, so that we're our second year project is uh, civic, or not our second year project, our second semester project is um, a public space in a rural environment. So that's why you've got the questions on that subject. Yeah, no, it's, I, yeah. I, I think it's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting proposition. A, yeah. A public um, in, a rural, in a rural place. I think quite often what, ones that, for examples that I have seen um, in recent years often do feel quite domestic in scale. Um, and I'm not, that's not necessarily a critique, but mm. it's an, an observation. You know, does it feel like a big, is, does it, is it expressed like a large house? You know, or, is it, or should it be something different? Should it be something more special? Yeah, I think that's something we'll definitely have to reflect on as we take our projects forward. Um, I think, so I, we've got a last question from Iona, if you want to ask that, or I can read it out. I think that it was, the question was covered with the last answer. I was also asking about the community aspect in the rural, rural environment and advice on how 
we could bring people together in an environment which is much less dense than a city. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely something that we are that that is kind of the the focus of the certainly the last couple of slides that that I showed as well. Um, yeah, because proximity, you know, where, where you're not dealing with you're not dealing with squares in the same way as you are in the city, where you've got lots of program and the, the kind of multiplicity of of functions um, that are activating a space. But nonetheless, I think like definition and activity of us of a space are um are kind of fun fundamental to 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 that social um social cohesion if you like so you know bringing as much I, I think density in a way is still kind of the answer you know to but but it's bringing what you have to, together to form form a space and if that's just one if that's one building then can you organize that building around organize the functions of that building around something that 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 feed into one area, you know, where things can overlap and um, you know, entrance, entrances and exits aren't necessarily, you know, at opposite sides, where do you arrive? It's all about kind of using as much, I think, as using as much as you're as you have in terms of functionality and program and kind of trying to condense it as much as possible because that's where kind of that's where social interaction comes from, kind of chance encounters, um, you know, condensing condensing the program that you have as much as possible so so use the building maybe perhaps to make to make a certain a certain density if that makes sense thank you yeah this, this is helpful um i think that is the last of the questions unless anyone else has a question which they want to call on and ask now um okay thank you very much that was that was really really good thank you um and there's definitely a lot for us to take away going into our our projects this semester as well um yeah and i think it's it's really exciting for us to see how much research you're taking into your into your built designs as well um and this idea of slow architecture um yeah so thank you very much. You're very welcome. Best of luck with your projects, everyone, the rest of the rest of the semester. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. See you later. Bye bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye.